Hi, my name is Rafael Fonseca. I'm a hematologist at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. I'm a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic and chair of the Department of Internal Medicine. Um, my clinical practice and my research is exclusively devoted uh, to the care and searching for new options for patients with multiple myeloma and related conditions. Uh, throughout the years, I've, I've uh, been engaged in uh, multiple aspects of research uh, surrounding multiple myeloma. Um, back to some things that you know we would call more basic, like understanding the genetic nature of the cells, understanding which uh, genetic markers distinguish myeloma from other tumor types. So, so I did a lot of uh, that research early on, but I also have been involved in a large number of uh, studies that test drugs. Uh, some of these drugs uh, have been taken all the way through to FDA approval, and we use them now for the treatment of multiple myeloma. So that's you know what we call phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. And and we also do a lot of correlative studies. Um, and by that I mean that we you know we sometimes work with a clinical trial where we collect samples, and this could be the blood or it could be a bone marrow sample. And then we test for things that might help us understand better why someone responds or not. How do people become uh, resistant to a specific treatment? Uh, can we develop better markers, for instance, of bone disease and the like? So there's there's plenty of work for sure in this field of myeloma research. Multiple myeloma belongs to the group of diseases that we think of uh, when we're thinking about blood cancers. Specifically, myeloma is a, a form of adult uh, bone marrow cancer that comes about when the cells that are called plasma cells convert into malignant cells. Under normal circumstances, plasma cells help our bodies. They produce the antibodies that give us immunity. But occasionally, these uh, cells become malignant, and that is a process that we call myeloma or multiple myeloma. Uh, in the disease itself, the cells are usually restricted to the space inside the bones in what we call the bone marrow. And there's a number of problems that can come about because of the growth of the cells. Um, including um, because the cells grow, they take some of the normal space. So a person may present with fatigue because they have anemia. That is a low red blood cell count. Uh, the cells can also cause problems in the bones. They can erode the bone structure. So a couple of things happen with that. One can have pain or in the more extreme situations, even fractures. And also that releases some of the calcium that our bones have into the circulation. So people may have a high calcium content in their blood. And lastly, the myeloma cells also uh, produce uh, a type of protein, uh, one of the fragments of the proteins that can filter down into the urine. So occasionally that also causes problems with the kidney in the form of renal failure. For most patients that we diagnose, they'll come uh, because they have some of the symptoms. So occasionally they will present because they have a history of back pain. Uh, sometimes they're seen in the hospital because someone has uh, poor kidney function and then they find that ultimately this was caused by their multiple myeloma or maybe a general practitioner finds uh, that the person has anemia and it's not otherwise explained. And then the patient goes to a hematologist and then they're diagnosed with myeloma. There's kind of the earlier step is something called the monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, referred to it as MGUS or MGUS. Uh, that condition is when there's a very discrete growth of these plasma cells, uh, usually to a point that there's going to be less than 10% of all the cells in a person's bone marrow. Uh, so pa patients or you know individuals with this will have um, uh, abnormal protein detected in their bloodstream, but they don't have any of the features I alluded to, so they don't have anemia or bone disease. As uh, and this is actually quite common. You know, if you look at uh, you know population uh, studies, up to two percent of people over the age of fifty have this. So it's a common common occurrence. Now this can evolve a little bit more, and then if if the cells are more than this ten percent, that's called smoldering multiple myeloma. And, and it will remain as such as smoldering multiple myeloma for as long as there is no evidence of a complication. Then once we see complications, that's when we say someone has multiple myeloma, active myeloma, or just simply myeloma, and that's when people require uh, treatment. We spend a lot of our time trying to define the boundaries between those three groups. So you have MGOS, you have smoldering, and you have active myeloma. And in fact, where we put the boundaries has changed. In fact, recently has changed a little bit to the point that we think that there are some patients who have 
more advanced forms of the smoldering that even though they're not quite symptomatic yet, that we should probably consider starting treatment. And in fact, uh, we're doing so in selected cases. You know, sometimes you can be very, very close and you can be totally different. So if you think of myeloma, myeloma is a cancer form of the very late stage of what we call the B cells, the whole family of B cells that are part of the immune system. Uh, so when I explain to patients, think of myeloma as the seniors in high school. And Waldenstrom's is like the juniors. So they're kind of just one step under. Um, uh, but what's interesting is that if you actually uh, look at the genetic makeup of myeloma, the genetic makeup of Waldenstrom's, even though they're neighbors and they're just like little, this little tiny separated, they're completely different. Uh, so even though they have a proximity in that process of you know the evolution of the B cells, they're completely different. The, the Waldenstrom's, the vast majority of them have a specific gene mutation, something called MYD88. And in fact, um, um, you know, they respond to a drug that has uh, essentially no use for, for myeloma patients. So um, they can be similar, but they can be different. Some drugs cross the boundary, and, but I think that has to do more with, you know, how cells both in Waldenstrom's and in myeloma produce some of the proteins. Uh, so, for instance, uh, proteasome inhibitors work in both diseases, but uh, they're fundamentally different, but they're kind of in the camp of what myeloma doctors see. The diagnosis of myeloma, first of all, determining whether the patient needs treatment or not, it's not always necessarily straightforward. And uh, the treatments have changed dramatically over the past several years. Uh, so much so that we have had a large number of approvals by the FDA since the late 1990s as new drugs uh, for treatment for myeloma. In fact, last month, we just saw one more drug being approved for the treatment of myeloma, and we anticipate more will follow. The challenges with all of those drugs, so that there's... There's a need for someone to put together, okay, you have the patient and, you know, what their symptoms are, what their problems are, what their preferences are for treatment, and then what the logistics would be for treatment, right? Then you have the disease, you have the myeloma, and, and, and with that, we want to understand how it's affecting the organs, how it's affecting the kidneys, um, but also we want to understand which of one of the genetic subtypes that is, because that has a significant impact on how we think about therapy. And, and then you have the drugs and the various treatments that are available. So someone has to put all of this together for the patient. Um, so one, one of the, the, the things we would normally say, and this is in no way self-serving, but we encourage patients also to have a myeloma specialist as part of their team. Patients can get their treatment anywhere, and it's, it's something that, that you know, can be done very, very well in community practices. But in my opinion, it doesn't hurt, and there's myeloma centers across the country. So, you, you know, you could go to where it's closer to you. So that would be number one. Number two is there's a good number of patient support organizations that provide information for patients. And the three that come to mind right now for me would be the International Myeloma Foundation, the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, and one which I'm working with quite closely now, it's called the Myeloma Crowd. And, and these organizations all have informational material, they have hotlines where patients can call and ask questions, and, and, and they can be guided in, in you know, how to go about deciding on their treatment. Um, as a comment for this last one that I just mentioned, this is the Myeloma Crowd, again, a patient-driven, not-for-profit organization. Uh, we just work with them in creating some a tool that is called the Health Tree. And the Health Tree is a really a cool thing. It's something where uh, patients can go into a website and they, they, enter, they enter their information. And, and it can be pretty detailed, as detailed as the patient wants to put in there. So some of the patients are very, very sophisticated. So they put you know, genetic markers and you know, they can put other conditions, they may have heart disease, etc. And the idea is to create a repository from which we can actually start uh, providing some conversation topics for patients to bring back to their doctors. So, you know, let me give you an example. If a patient is getting a medication and we know with that medication you should be getting another preventive medicine, and, and we see that's not in your medication, so this tool would say, you know, you should talk to your doctor about this. So it's one of the ways in which trying to uh, have a greater engagement from the patient perspective. Health tree will serve, um, one is it could serve as, as, as this mechanism through which patients can get feedback and become more informed, um, let's use the word consumer at this point, informed consumers of their healthcare, right? So they're going to be more, uh, better equipped to have the conversation with the doctors. And I can tell you as a doctor, if I can spend most of my time talking to patients about, uh, you know, the pros and cons of, of uh, the different treatments, 
is much better than me having to spend half of my visits sorting out through faxes, right? So it makes the encounter more valuable. So that's one thing. Uh, the other one, it, it will lead to to research because then you know patients are going to be able to um, you know put their information. That information can be connected and reports can be generated. Uh, the health tree has something that can be pushed for queries to patients. So I mean, just imagine this: if, if there's a new drug and someone says, "Hey, listen, I'm having migraines," and you could ask, oh, "Who else is having migraines?" Suddenly, we turn out uh, to find out that a specific drug is causing migraines. You would know that through the health tree. It connects people with clinical trials, so it, it's working with, an, with a separate entity. It's a company that's called Spark Cures, uh, which was uh, created by Brian McMahon, who's really in a mission to find clinical trials for myeloma patients. He, his personal story uh, dates back to when his mom was diagnosed uh, with myeloma, and he's just been on this mission to make clinical trials accessible for patients, so it would connect you to that. It has a health tree university, which has all sorts of videos that are educational for patients, and also, it will collect, connect patients with uh, financial support assistance mechanisms for co-pays, et cetera. So still in its infancy, there's already, I think, close to 5,000 patients registered to Health Tree, And the idea is that more and more will come together on this. Probably what we're all most excited about are what we call T-cell engagement type treatments. And that involves both the CAR T-cells as well as the bispecific antibodies. Um, they both have shown proof of principle, so they both are working in the area of myeloma. There's clearly a plethora of clinical trials. I, I heard from someone there's over 40 CAR T-cell trials being conducted uh, for multiple myeloma. For those of the audience who may not know, so a CAR T-cell trial is a trial where you take out one of those T-cells that we have in our body. They, you know, they can collect them from the blood. You send them elsewhere, meaning they, they're sent to a factory through, through uh, genetic engineering. You change them, so they actually become professional assassins against myeloma cells. And then those shells are shipped back to the center where the patient is located at, and they're given back into the vein. So it's essentially like taking your own T cells, training them uh, you know, to become uh, assassins of myeloma cells, and then be given, be given back to the patient. Um, that's um, a strategy that has worked and it's already commercially available for lymphoma and leukemia, so we're hoping myeloma soon will have that. Uh, an alternative strategy is to use what we call the bispecifics and the bites. It's kind of the same thing, but instead of taking the cells out, you, you introduce a molecule into the body that brings together the T cell and the myeloma cell. And I, I always like to use this analogy, T cells are like uh, you know, that story of the frog and the scorpion that, you know, a frog is, is going to cross the river and the scorpion goes, can you let me cross on your back? And the frog goes, no, I won't because you're a scorpion, you know, you're going to you're gonna sting me and the scorpion promises not to sting the frog, gets on top of the frog in the middle of the river, stings the, the frog, right? right. The right. frog asks, and why did you do that? And the scorpion responds, it's in my nature. And it is in the nature of T cells, whenever they're next to a target cell, in this case a myeloma cell, they will attack that cell. And, and for the viewers uh, of this video, I invite them to do Google search and find all those videos of T cells attacking cancer cells. They're really, really cool. Okay. Uh, so, so, so instead of taking the cells out, you just put a molecule. I kind of describe it like a matchmaker or a double-sided Velcro, right? That it brings together the T cell and the target cell, and, and in doing so, kills myeloma cells. So, so Selenexer is uh, supposed to be a um, blocker of a pump that uh, removes uh, certain proteins from the cell nucleus. Uh, the premise uh, upon which this was developed is that if you can increase the concentration of certain proteins that act as we call tumor suppressors, so those would be breaks against the cells dividing you know, rapidly, perhaps that would allow cells to signal and say, you know, I shouldn't divide more, and perhaps I should die. That's the whole concept of Selenexer. So... It was recently approved uh, for the treatment of a very advanced myeloma, and and um, you know there's there's proof of principle, of course, that it works. Uh, it's a drug that it still is in diapers, and and we don't quite yet know how to use it. Mm -hmm. How it it was originally tested was um, it came out to, to have a very significant uh, toxicity when it comes down to some some of the issues of lack of appetite, nausea, and in some patients, a low sodium. Now, um, the, the way it was done, it was with, with an administration twice per week, um, and, but there's a lot of work going on in other tumor types, and there's a lot of work going on with um, uh, combinations, a lot of work being done in combination also with some of the drugs that can help ameliorate the symptoms.
And sometimes even doing simple changes, and I think I predict probably the first change will be uh, mostly people using it once per week instead of twice per week. And perhaps in combination with other drugs, it will be a sensitizer to those drugs. So I, I know there was a, a bit of a negative reception to it, but I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's great. We have one more option. We need to understand how it's going to be used. And in fact, that's the case with almost every single myeloma drug. You know, we started with dexamethasone. We used to give 40 milligrams a day for four days in a row three times per month, which is just massive. We don't do that anymore. Yeah. So alunamide, we started with 800 milligrams. Now most people treat between 50 and 200 milligrams. Uh, when you know when we started with uh, bortezomib, also known the commercial name is Velcade, patients used to get it intravenous twice per week, and with that we had just horrific rates of peripheral neuropathy. Now we do it once a week, subcutaneous. So I actually have uh, not lost hope, but in fact I'm happy to know that we will have another option. I uh, while our institution participated in the trial, I haven't had the chance to use the drug yet, but I'm sure that. Uh, for patients who who don't have other options, where you know where we will be using some of this, and then perhaps more exciting as we get uh, into the future and we have the results of some of the clinical trials, particularly in combination, I think there's a good possibility this could be as a sensitizer for, for some of these drugs, uh, particularly if we can manage the toxicity. So I don't I don't think the full story is out there on Celnex or yet. If you read every single textbook and every single article, it says myeloma is not curable. And I think to have that conversation, we need, first need to define what being curable means. If, you, if we mean by that, that a person can get five days of a treatment and then, then um, the majority of the patients will never again have to deal with that, so strep throat is highly curable, well then myeloma is not curable. Uh, but if we, if we define cure as a fraction of patients being able to enjoy normal life expectancy even after diagnosis, then there's a fraction of myeloma patients that can be cured. So, so I actually I sometimes get into trouble with this because it's just how people frame the definition of what they think about being cured. Sure. But there are myeloma patients that are cured from the disease. And, and there's a, a number of patients I, I have seen over the years and a number of patients I have in my practice who have had treatment 10, 15, 20 years ago and, and, and remain with good control, sometimes with no detectable myeloma, sometimes even with detectable myeloma. And, you know, the, the, in fact, I, I'm, I'm not her treating physician, and this is public information because this was out in a write-up yesterday, but the founder of the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, which, by the way, has been just a tremendous force behind all of this progress, sure. was diagnosed with myeloma 23 years ago. And she was talking about how she thought she would never see her kids go to school, and her daughter is now going to Harvard uh, Business School. So how cool is that? 23 yeah. years ago. Even if you have detectable proteins, and I think we have a fraction of patients that, that can achieve that. Unfortunately, it still is a minority of patients. So I, I would like to have a future where we can have a treatment that is short, it's free, side effects free, and cures everyone. But as we get there, we've made tremendous progress. So when, when I first started in myeloma, you know, we would tell patients you're facing about maybe two to three years at best, and we had almost no, no drugs. In fact, almost no one wanted to do myeloma because there were no treatment options. Nowadays, I think the survival for most myeloma patients can be measured in several to many years, occasionally decades. And, and I always remind patients of something, you know, with all of these approvals that we have, if I see you today and I treat you with today's best, so 2019's best, I, I can think that there's there's a 50% chance on many cases that you're going to be around uh, 10 years or later. And if that is the case, how will we treat myeloma in 2029? I don't know. Sure. And, and that's what we call the value of options, right? And because of all the research that you alluded to and people are being able to uh, you know, participate in clinical trials, they will have options that don't exist today. You know, honestly, the first advice I would tell them is to go to Spark Cures because you can put your, your information that would help you. There's clinicaltrials.gov, and that's the, the kind of the core and the central repository. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you go there, it's not that easy to find trials because there's many, many trials, and you don't know if you're eligible or not. Spark Cures is, you know, it's free for patients. What they do is you put your information, and it's really cool because it will tell you, okay, you're potentially eligible for these trials. You can choose what distance you're willing to travel. It will tell you that maybe you're not eligible, but you might be eligible in the future. And also, it has a really neat tool that uh, tells you about centers of support. So let's say, you know, you live in L.A., but you have um, a brother or a sister in, in Atlanta that can help you out. And it turns out Atlanta has a great myeloma center, Emory University. Well, 
suddenly Atlanta opens up because maybe you can stay with them, you can stay at their home and be treated there. So I, I think that's that's one of one of the, the great things of tools like that. So that would be number one. Number two is always remember that clinical trials really bring the best to the very front. And uh, physicians like myself and other, uh, other centers, whenever we're seeing a patient, just know that in the back of our mind, we're always thinking, is there a trial that could bring an option for this patient? Now, if I don't talk about a trial normally, and I always tell this to my patients, and maybe that there's nothing that I can think would be better than what we're going to recommend, so so non-clinical trial care. Uh, but trials often open up new avenues for uh, for patients to consider, and these new avenues could be in the form of adding something to something that's already working. So, you know, let, let me give you an example. There's this Griffin trial for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. Uh, which is a um, small study is uh, uh, conducted by Dr. Peter Borges, where they added their tumumab, Darzelex, to the standard induction with uh, what we call BRD. In doing so, they were able to greatly increase the response rate of patients. So this is going to lead to the next clinical trials, what we call phase three trials. But just for reference, in that particular trial, 94% of patients were able to achieve a complete response at the end of the consolidation period. So really remarkable, you know, responses. So that's how trials can help you. Trials can also help you by bringing drugs that are not yet approved and yet may show some promise. So, so there are drugs. Uh, for instance, I'll give you an example. There's this new antibody by uh, uh, from JSK, which is an antibody that uh, targets myeloma and it has a warhead attached to it. That is, it has a, a molecule that is going to be toxic to myeloma cells, and it seems to be working. It has some toxicity, so we're trying to understand how to best use it. But it seems to work even in cases where nothing else was working, and that's only available through clinical trials. So, so never think of trials as, oh, I'm just going to be kind of exposed to some random thought. No, they're very, very well thought through. They've been through the ethics committees of the various institutions. The large ones have to be endorsed by the FDA. So there's mm -hmm. just an incredible amount of detail and care that goes into planning these trials. So more often than not, it's, uh, you, you have that extra level of assurance. I'm going to start by saying I realize everything I tell you is much easier being told by the doctor, right? Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't want to meet patients in the clinic. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm cognizant of the difficulty that a diagnosis places on a person and on their family and how that changes our whole perception of the world. So, so, so I'll say that first as a disclaimer. Number two is don't give up. Myeloma, is the, there is no time to be nihilistic in myeloma. I will always respect your choices as you proceed with your treatment opportunities, but we have a lot of good opportunities and there's a very good possibility that a person's life can be extended with effective treatment very significantly. And, and, and one of the key points that, that I would make for this point is that we sometimes get the question, you know what, I am about quality, not about quantity. I'll tell you what, the good news is in myeloma, they both go hand in hand. That is not to discount the possibility of toxicities, which will occur sometimes with the, with the treatment. Some of them are more serious than others. Uh, but for the most part, if we can't control the disease, the quality of life improves substantially. Uh, for instance, the pain can be significantly relieved uh, uh, with effective myeloma treatment. And number three would be uh, seek out opportunities and uh, connections, be that in the form of the patient support organizations, information like this, information like I mentioned potentially with a health tree, and look at opportunities for, for clinical trials. But I as I have no doubt, that an informed patient ends up being a better patient for themselves and for their families. And uh, there's nothing wrong with being a sophisticated patient. I'd rather see someone in my office who knows a lot about their disease, where, again, we can spend our time talking about some of the specific aspects of treatments uh, as opposed to where we have to go back, back to the basics. I think it's a lot better return on investment on your time that you're going to be spending with the doctors.